Hi, I'm Carol Gravelin. I'm happy to introduce Professor Emeritus Charles Taylor and also Francois Crepeau, UN Special Rapporteur on Migrants, Human Rights, and he's also McGill Director for the Center of Human Rights and Legal Pluralism. I asked them both to share their thoughts about what brought them to be interested in the migrant question in the first place, and then maybe share their thoughts as well on what's awaiting us, uh, their future, and maybe their future with us and them. Um, intellectually, it was my doctoral studies. I had to work in order to sustain myself, and so I worked into a, um, in, in a research center, and I was given the choice between mental health or migration. I chose migration without really knowing anything about it. And then I started to do research with the team in the deep suburbs of Paris, interviewing school teachers, um, street educators, um, people working in town hall, etc. And, and it really was a complete discovery of a world that I really didn't know. At emotional level, I think that what um, uh, really clinched it was when I figured out that I had seen my mother crying at every letter that she received from France. She was an immigrant from France, and at the time, it, she came by boat to Montreal. And so receiving a letter was an important moment for her, and the distance was materialized by the, by the crying. And I connected that many, many decades later to my interest in migration. I can see that, yeah. Now, in my case, I was a graduate student at the time of the Hungarian Revolution in 56, and I was also a member of a kind of small NGO, and I set up, a, I was a sort of head of a field office in Vienna at that point, finding the student refugees and finding ways to get them abroad. And what impressed me then was the way the world, I mean, the Western world really responded. The civil society, they were just, yes, we help, do everything. The whole forestry school of Chaperon was brought to Canada, and it was extraordinary. We emptied the camps in record time, and I saw that that is because of this tremendous desire on the part of civil society. With a civil society like that, the capacity of absorption is just immense. Yeah. And I compare that today, particularly very ironically, <laughs> when the borders closed in Hungary, I had this terrible feeling, you know, this, this the civil societies today, maybe Hungary is an exceptional case, but I don't feel our civil societies today have that kind of response. It's been destroyed or undermined by fear, and something we'll have to talk about. But, <clears throat> so what just, what happened? I think it's something relatively recent, but I think that it's also the case that if one kept up these civil society actions, that this country would be better placed. And my example here is Canada. Because we have these programs that existed before this crisis, a particular crisis, where people can get together and put pool money and say, we'll take a refugee or a refugee family. And that's why I think it was possible for our prime minister not to follow a lot of the rest of the world last year, right, and say, no, 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 we, we're full up, we, we, we have to stop, because there's some kind of support in civil society. And I think our big, big problem is that that's been poisoned in various places by fear, by sense that these people are dangerous, by the whole populist phenomenon which we have to, we have to go into. And it's a kind of reversal. Even you could see it in Germany happening yeah. between when Merkel first said that people come in and that awful New Year's Eve in Köln a couple of years ago in which there was this fear in, you know, injected into people, these, these people are dangerous. Yeah, and I, and I think populism in this form is, is the phenomenon that has, is, is the defining phenomenon that has been fueled by 25 years of increasing, increasingly stark border controls. Mm -hmm started probably with the Schengen mechanism in Europe when the common market was finally established with free movement within Europe and, and pushing all the border controls to the common borders, the external borders of the EU. And for that, they had to create a reason to, re to increase the kind of control they had at external borders, airports yeah. and ports and physical and land borders. 
Um, but it was enhanced with 9-11 yeah. and then all the other um, terrorist attacks in London and, and Madrid and everywhere else. To me, the, the, the populist um, uh, movement is particularly to blame because the, if, if we look at the discourse of Gerd Wilders and Marine Le Pen and Trump, most of what they talk about is about identity and the difference between us and them. Yeah. Who knows about the industrial policy of Marine Le Pen? Who knows about the uh, agricultural policy of Gerd Wilders? Mm. They only talk about one thing, and they only talk about it because there's no pushback. And there's no pushback because the people they're talking about are not part of the political, mm -hmm. um, of, the, of the constituency. They don't speak up. Yeah. If we look at marginalized portions of the society before women, aboriginals, detainees, gays and lesbians, as soon as they started speaking up, took to the floor and, and came into came onto the political stage, politicians changed their language, their attitudes, and, and atti general attitudes changed, but they were claiming equal citizenship, mm -hmm. something that migrants can't do. Yeah. And so migrants yeah. are singled out by the populist as danger to everything else because they can't react and they yeah. can't change the stereotypes and the fantasies as women have changed them, yeah. even though there's still work to be done. But even where some people ha are from migrant communities a little bit earlier are very much part of the population, I'm thinking of yeah. France, the voting population, there's been such a poisoning of their identity that they are they're now developing a counter-identity. That's exactly. that they're not developing saying we're French as much as you are. Some are, yeah. but the, they're now developing a counter-identity, and the the cavern is, is the chasm is getting deeper and deeper between the two populations. But I think that populism is working for another re now for another reason. Almost everywhere, not everywhere, but almost everywhere, with, with Trump in the United States, with Marine Le Pen, mm -hmm. uh, with the Builders, it's always appealing to a native part of the population, which feels hard done by, that mm -hmm. they haven't been listened mm -hmm. to. So they make an appeal almost as though they're appealing uh, uh, to the anti-elites and to the sense of, uh, mm -hmm. of grievance that these have, and then putting the blame on <coughs> these uh, outsiders as against on the mechanisms mm -hmm. that have actually produced this kind of thing. Yeah. So it's in a sense a failure of globalization. It's a failure in the West of globalization whose fruits have not been evenly distributed enough, yeah. and you can see that. So that's, that's the Trump formula. We've got to close the borders, but at the same time, we have yeah. to come down hard on the elements that don't really, don't really belong here. Yeah. With the, the caveat or, or the added element that most of what is said on immigration is simply wrong. It's false, yeah. yeah. It's false. Yeah, I know. And, and you can see that uh, in most countries, there is lots of research done yeah. on how migrants contribute to society, that yeah. the fact that they pay more taxes than they take services, the fact that there's less criminality in migrant communities than in the native communities. Yeah. So all this is out there and has been there for 30 years. It never comes up in the political debate, yeah. except up to a certain point, but not to a sufficient point in the US because you have this huge um, Latino community who yeah. votes yeah. Because, because they are Americans of Mexican or Central American origin. But even then, even there, you have this massive yeah. um, uh, populist vote. But I think this, this issue of the fantasies and the stereotypes, yeah. which resemble what happened in the 30s yeah. Uh, for other communities, but we, we have these fantasies and we cannot dispel them because the people most um, interested don't speak up or cannot speak up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's also that uh, these fantasies are very powerful because there's a 
certain fear underlying them. It's sort of oh, understandable yes. people are afraid. And you see this also in Europe. Uh, the European. Europeans saying, well, in 20 years, uh, Muslims are going to be a majority. And you say, yeah. what? I mean, <laughs> yeah. Give me any figures. Yeah. The second thing is the idea that they don't integrate. And, and yeah. of course, in Quebec, the, the, some of the, the vast members of the society, because they've come here with competences that we lack, and they're just Certainly. eager to go. So how do you bridge that gap? How do you undercut uh, a stereotype, which is psychologically understandable at the first instance? How do you undercut it? And mm. I think our media have failed us. But in mm. our case also, in Quebec, our political leadership has failed us. Mm -hmm. Because when they oh, tried yes. out this Charte des Valeurs, mm -hmm. you know, what people collect from that is, hey, these people, are, we have to treat them differently because yeah. they're kind of a little bit uh, yep. Not, uh, and that stirs up these fears, and then you get these awful incidents, people shouting at immigrants in the street Absolutely. after Trump's campaign. Yeah. Yeah. Terrible. So you get into this, uh, the political class, as it were, as a whole, has to do its job, and the yeah. media have to help us do that job. But, the, but we, I, I, as much as we need to blame the political class, we need to realize that this is a structural limit of electoral democracy. Mm -hmm. The, the system, the best system we've ever invented to govern ourselves, functions with electoral incentives. Yeah. Men reacted to women's issues when women took to the stage yeah. and decided, okay, you know, and pushed back the men and said, okay, um, sexual harassment is an issue yeah. and, and we need to tackle that. And suddenly men realized that what they had been joking about actually was a serious matter. Yeah. And, and that is not happening with migrants because migrants are not invited to the table and migrants can neither punish nor reward politicians by their votes. Yeah. And so there is very little incentive for even very good politicians to say anything about migrants when saying something good about migrants can damage mm -hmm. their chances in the next election. And, and, and let's, you know, that's their job to win elections. Yeah. So yeah. we can't blame them too much for that. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm really um, uh, I'm puzzled by how this is going to change in the present circumstances. I think that at one point we should connect vote with residence. If, if, you, if you reside here, pay taxes and obey the law, you should have a say in how the law is made and how the taxes are spent. Mm -hmm. And I'm shocked by the fact that, for example, um, Argentinians who are third generation Italian immigrants if it, that means anything, by the way, um, can vote for the Italian parliament mm -hmm. when you have so many third generation Turks in Germany yeah. who cannot vote for the German yeah. parliament. So residence and vote at one point will have to be connected. But that is, again, linked to identity. It's not happening now. And therefore, the migrants themselves cannot push back all those yeah. stereotypes well, about them. I think some European countries for local government. Yes. Yeah. The, do well, that. I, I guess you have to be a European uh, citizen. member citizen, right, to do that. Yeah, 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 yeah. And cities are good with migrants. Yes. Yeah. Almost everywhere. Cities are actually, the city politics understands migrant integration much better yeah. because they know the people. It's not a, a fantasy uh, group of, of threatening, you know, a threatening mass. It's actually people we know because we see them in the street. Yeah, and yeah. city politics is much better. We've seen Montreal becoming a, uh, a uh, refuge city recently, yeah, a sanctuary yeah. city. So I think s city politics can be, uh, should be emulated at national level. Mm -hmm. New York is very good. San Francisco has very good policies as well. Yeah. But it's very hard to see people accepting a citizenship law, yeah. which would be different, uh, that different from ours, that you not wait three years and so on, but that you give votes. So that may not be a route we can actually go. But I'm okay. not as sure I entirely agree with you that we can accept that some people can break ranks, uh, some members of the political class can break ranks and make the problem actually worse. And I'm wondering if well, particularly in Quebec, at the, in the aftermath of that terrible assassination yeah. in January, if we can't bring home to the whole political class that they they probably can't make it better, but they can make it much worse Absolutely. by stepping out of line like that yeah. and really stigmatizing, uh, scapegoating, that's what it is, mm -hmm. right? There has to be, we have to develop enough political traction behind that negative 
Now, I think we can do that if we can find a politics that will take the other big attraction away from the populist parties, which is they're actually defending ordinary people who haven't had their share. And as you said, none of them has a plan. Not have no yeah. plan. Hasn't got a plan to it's put <laughs> the workers back to work in some of these, uh, yeah. you know, Rust Belt and uh, you know, <laughs> and of course, uh, Trump hasn't got a plan like that either. So we need to have electoral competition in which we're, uh, you know, a decent party is appealing back to those, to those voters. I, I fear that we are going to have to go through, as the U.S. is now going through. We have to go through a populist moment, which may last a decade. And these populist policies will be tried. I, I'm utterly convinced that they will fail yeah. um, quite dramatically. They will not bring um, relief to the, the class of people who believe they've been robbed of, of the wealth of globalization. Uh, and they will create a divisiveness which will be yeah. tragic in society. And at one point, I think the, uh, the population will realize, okay, this is, this is too much. We can't continue yeah. like this. And, and we'll come back to our senses and change that. The problem with the populists is that they've been the, the untested recourse yeah. for 40 years. Yes. And at one point, people say, okay, let's try them too. Yeah. Well, let's try them. Let's go for it. Let's see Madame Le Pen wow. in power. Let's, I'm, I'm, I'm not wishing yeah, for I know, it. I know, I know, but, but I'm uh, telling myself, yeah. if this is what it takes to, to actually create a craving for yeah. another type of politics, well, let's, we'll have to do it. Yeah, but th this can go very far. You oh. see, we're, yeah. we're within two short steps of dissolving the European Union. Yep. Step one, if Madame Le Pen wins. Step two, if she pulls off, let's call it Frexit, right? Yeah. It's the end of the European Union yeah. as we know it. So I would like to, <laughs> yeah. maybe we could stop that happening. But I agree that, you know, I'm maybe too optimistic. In, in One other element that we can bring into, into the conversation is the fact that there's something that populists hate almost more than anything else. It's institutions, mm. institutions yeah. that tell them what they cannot say or what they cannot do, like human rights commissions, tribunals, courts, supreme yeah. courts, yeah. charters of rights and freedoms and things like that, which limit, because they've been instituted for that, limit their right to say whatever they want yeah. in the name of having been elected by a majority of the people, even though we know that some of them <laughs> haven't. <laughs> um, and so, these ins I'm, I'm sort of counting on these institutions yeah. to limit the capacity of those populist politicians to do damage when they come to power. We've seen in the U.S. the courts reacting. We've seen in Europe the European Court of Human Rights, the European Court of Justice reacting also to populist uh, politicians as well. In Canada, we've had a few clashes between yeah. courts and a previous government, um, but we hear this, this loud appeal by the populists against unelected judges yeah. who prevent them. So-called judges. <laughs> So-called judges, exactly. <laughs> and I think that is something that we've created post-war, mostly, with the welfare state, created institutions that limit the power of majorities. Mm -hmm. And I think that, to me, is something that we need to nurture, because that is probably, if we go through this period of populism, this is what can limit the damage for the time being yeah. until it's been proven that populist policies are yeah. a disaster. Yeah. And another reason why I hope we can, as it were, push back right away as against in, in N years time when they've tried out and failed, is that I think what we see now is just a shadow of what's going to happen when climate change really kicks in. We're going to have refugee crisis, the mother of all refugee crises, that, you know, and I, that fills me with apprehension, and that's not very far away. Already, you know, people who are fleeing from the Sahel area, say, you know, in, the, uh, in uh, the south of Sudan there, it is partly, on the bottom, climate yeah. refugees. It doesn't immediately play out that way. People don't say, I'm a climate refugee, but yeah, no going to be more and more, even if we can curb some of these terrible civil wars, which are now sending people away from home. Yeah. Droughts yeah. and floods yeah. will, be, will be increasingly mm -hmm. uh, disruptive, yeah. absolutely.
Francois was saying, if only we could get the facts out there, this is the problem, that we've all had experience, all the host countries, that refugees have just an incredible record. Of, I mean, for one thing, to, to get to that point, you have to have a lot of entrepreneurship, a lot of go and drive and so on. And what you were talking about, about people in the camps are looking forward to, looking to the future and so on. They're exemplary citizens, productive. There are much fewer of them on the welfare rolls, if you like, than the natives, you see. So that kind of record can get established in a society and people can see that and it isn't covered over with a lot of total mythology and so on. That's a very, very powerful Mm -hmm. uh, powerful tool. I think you even see this in the States, not all the pushback against That's Trump. The big slogan is we're all uh, immigrants. We're all, so people recognize that, you know, my grandfather came here and was exactly the same position as these people now, mm -hmm. but look what we've done, look what we've built. Yeah, that I think is something that we can count on in the long run. Yeah, I, I also see a number of silver linings. Um, and, and we, can, we can count them. For example, the good media. The good media in the past six, seven years has, you know, taken the measure of the issues. They have brought together, you know, they, there's now an immigration correspondent of the New York Times. This didn't exist five years ago. Um, they have been to Idomini, they have been to the Andaman Sea, they have been to places, interviewed migrants. They know what they're talking about. They, they had no clue 10 years ago. Now they know. Now they've been there. So they are reporting much better. The yellow press will remain the yellow press. But the good media are doing a very good job nowadays. Um, um, uh, research. There's a lot more research on migration issues today than there were 10 years ago. And certainly in, in my field, law, there was no research on, on, on refugee and migration really to speak of 10, 15 years ago. Um, uh, the, uh, if, if we look at the youth, the whole issue is that of mobility. The youth is mobile. The youth is diverse in most of our countries because society is increasingly diverse. I think that, I mean, when I was 20 or when I was 15, going to Ontario was sort of exotic from <laughs> Montreal, you know? It was already going somewhere else with a different culture, a different language. F for kids in Montreal today who have friends from all over the world, it's not, the, the world is not that far. And so they will bring to politics in 20, 25 years from now that openness, their friends, their, the differences that they experience every day that we didn't experience. My class was very white at school when I was in primary school, for example. That has changed. That, that will bring you know, something completely different over time. Um, civil society is mobilized, and we've seen it. Lawyers are mobilized. Churches in Germany, but elsewhere, are completely mobilized on this issue and much stronger. And the migrants themselves are so extraordinary. Yeah. The migrants are, you know, are a discovery. And, and what I brought here, just uh, since I was asked to bring something, the, the, this is a um, sheet of paper with, as you can see, writing on, in, in a language that I can't read. I don't think it's Arabic. I think it's another language, but I'm not sure. This one was picked up in a refugee camp in Djibouti, the Ali Ade camp in Djibouti. And I have another one here that was uh, picked up, same, same, you know. This was picked up in Idomeni in Greece last year. Uh, this is to show that when migrants are waiting in a refugee camp, where migrants are in a detention center, they're already preparing tomorrow. They're not in the detention center. They are tomorrow. They're already planning. You see that in, on the walls of cells in police stations or in, um, in, border, in border crossings. Uh, you will see the itinerary of those people, including the border crossing. But the itinerary continues. And they tell you what cities they're going to go to afterwards. <laughs> so they're already planning all this. They are already in the future. And that is, to me, extremely inspiring. It's not at all a, a, um, a story of despair, a story of misery, a story of, of everything you know, is rotten and nothing's going to happen. It's a story about seeking dignity and, and the, the manifest belief that they're going to find it. And it's been the story of migration forever.